Everybody, thank you for being here. We have a full house. And uh, please welcome Ian McGonigal. Ian, thanks for being here, man. Thanks, Matt. Good to be here. You got it. Ian has his own consulting company, The Experiential Executive. But Ian has a big background in experiential marketing on the event side, trade show side with Jack Morton, with George P. Johnson. I know you held a lot of titles and different really cool things that you've done from them, particularly on the strategy side. So it is a pleasure to have you here today. And we are really going to discuss experiential trade show strategy and event strategy, and really try to dive as deep into it as we can, rather than staying at the surface level, right? Let's, I want to kind of move into it and give as much context to people as we can, because I think we're getting to this place where it's been talked about for years, right? Mm -hmm. It's been talked about. And I think now people are really getting in this age and time where brands are like, okay, this is a must. One of the things that, that I see, or at least tips me off is big brands at large festivals, large activations, large conferences, stuff like South by Southwest, you know, the Cannes festivals, what are they doing? They're doing out of the box, experiential, engaging, unique things. So in my experience, doing in this industry, I find that, you know, B2C moves way quicker and is ahead of B2B. So mm -hmm. I think it's kind of what we're going to be seeing here. So give us just a little bit of background in experiential strategy and kind of where you are from back then to today, just so everybody has a little background on it. Okay. Well, where I started, I actually started on brand side as a brand marketer. I worked for companies like GE and Bose and had a lot of fun working at those companies. So B2B and B2C. Then I made the leap to agency side and joined George P. Johnson, where I worked both in client services and strategy for a very long time. It was great to work at GPJ, did a ton of work in tech and, and, and automotive and all kinds of other things. And then I joined Jack Martin to uh, Jack Martin to uh, lead their strategy practice for a few years, and then from there I bounced around to a couple of smaller agencies, mostly in growth and roles around strategy. So I really enjoyed that. A few years ago, about five years ago now, I decided to start my own practice because I learned that about eighty percent of the time brands want to be strategic, but about twenty percent of the time they want to pay for strategy, which is a very difficult thing for an agency to keep full-time strategy resources on boat. And I also found that on the agency side for, for brands, it becomes very expensive, right? Because the way an agency makes money are, you know, hours times dollars, and you need as many roles as possible packed into an account in order for the agency to be profitable. Not that those roles aren't adding a lot of value, but when it comes to strategy, you don't necessarily need to have an account manager and a project manager and a traffic manager and all these people around you, you just need someone to do the good work. So I thought there was an opportunity. So I jumped in there and said, you know what, I'm going to call some of my clients, see if they'd be interested in working with me and took the leap. And I'm scared to death every day, but I love working with my clients. It gets me back to doing the real hands-on strategy work that I love. Yeah. And it allows my clients to really have something that they can uh, they can afford to do without having to have this huge infrastructure behind it. And then they can take those strategies anywhere. They can take it to an agency or an exhibit house or use it internally yeah. So that they can build their brand and drive their demand and everything else they're trying to accomplish. So, Awesome. So let's talk about it. I am a firm believer that the best brands and the best companies are being intentional, strategic, experiential, right? And they are, by doing those three things, they are engaging their customers in meaningful ways, whether it's digitally or whether it's face-to-face. Right. So okay. tell me a little about what do you see? What are from a broad stroke, what are some of the best companies doing strategically and experientially? What are you seeing? Well, I think it comes down to first and foremost, understanding your brand and your brand objectives, right? And we all talk about what are your objectives? What are the things you're trying to accomplish in an event? And you know, if you don't nail that first and foremost, everything you do afterwards is not going to make you happy. You're not going to achieve those objectives. So I always say that, you know, it's best to have no more than one to three objectives for an event. And I know that, you know, for all you planners out there, you're thinking about, well, all my bot, my boss, and this guy and this organization and this department, they all have different things they're trying to accomplish. How do I, you know, nail it down? Well, you need to force it, you need to do some stakeholder alignment up front. Because at the end of the day, you can't design an effective experience against 20 objectives. You need to say, all right, what is the one main thing we're trying to accomplish and maybe have a couple of other ancillaries around there? So it starts with objectives, and I'll get into a little bit more detail in, in just a second. 
But then it goes into understanding your audience. And I'm not saying that you need to find, oh, this person's a manager of finance or a healthcare provider or you know whatever the role is you're targeting. You need to understand who they are as human beings first and foremost. And that's something a lot of us fail at in the B2B space, especially on the B2C side, we're much better at that because there's all kinds of money being spent on developing audience personas and researching consumers and understanding what makes them tick and all of that. On the B2B side, we're not as good at that. So it is important to really understand who these people are as people, right? And it could be as simple as, is this a Gen Z audience? Is this a boomer audience, right? Start with the generation that they typically are. Look at their roles and the pain points that they have. Really understand you know, what their interests are based on their roles and their personas. Observe them, survey them. I'm working on a project with Eaton right now where it's all about understanding electrical contractors as people and something they've never embarked on. And it's really exciting to do. So it gives us an opportunity to understand what makes these guys tick? What's their day look like? How can we create a campaign for them that's really going to resonate and be meaningful for them. So if you understand your brand and you understand your audience, the third part is to understand what's happening in the marketplace. So what trends are out there you can capitalize on or avoid? What are your competitors doing? What's happening in your industry that you need to know about so that what you do isn't tone deaf, that it resonates, that it's meaningful, that it stands out. So that's sort of a macro view of looking at those three things. To become experiential, what happens in the very middle of those three things is an insight you get. You say, okay, here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Here's what my audience is into. And and here's where they consume media. And here's what's happening in the marketplace. And you take those three things and just by going through some mind mapping or some brainstorming or going out there, you can come up with some really interesting ideas. And, And when I say trends... I don't just mean event trends, right? Oh, 47% of event marketers are increasing their budgets. That means nothing to anybody, right? What you need to understand is what's hot, what's interesting, what's new right now? Um, What are people doing on TikTok, (laughs) right? Really think about what are those things that are catching the imagination? And there's a lot of great books out there on how to think a little bit differently, right? I like the originals. I like the Icarus Deception, Psychology, Influence and Persuasion. There's a bunch of books out there that teach you how to think differently and find that thing. So I I like to look at other industries. I like to look at other publications. I like to look at other walks of life to see what's working and seeing if I can move it to another industry or move it into events, right? I was joking with my daughter this morning, and she used to be a goth when she was a, a teenager, right? She used to have all the black makeup and everything. But I mean, she was a poster child for Hot Topic. It was hilarious. And Back then, it wasn't a phase, it was a lifestyle. But now she's, you know, all sunshine and rainbows, totally different person. But I came across this thing on TikTok, which is goths in places that you don't expect them, right? And it were these goth guys that are like at an amusement park or at a barbecue or places you don't expect them to be camping, right? And I thought it was interesting, not because I found it hilarious because of my daughter, but because that sort of talks about what you want experiential to be. And it's showing up in a perhaps the same place, but a different place with something completely unexpected, something people don't expect that will stand out and is truly an experience, something that really immerses them. So we'll talk about experiential, which I know is the the purpose of this whole conversation. For something to be experiential, you need to think about the root of the word. Is it an experience or is it just a booth or is it just a talking head on stage? To be an experience, it needs to invite the end user, right? The customer, the prospect, whoever it is, to be part of it. They need to participate in it. In fact, I looked at some of the things at CES, which were interesting to me. Nikon had an excellent booth where they had this futuristic Tron-like motorcycle. And they were showing how their video and photography production equipment really worked and what the benefits of it were. And it was on a mini stage and people could go sit on this Tron cycle and they do a full video production of the adventures of you on this cycle, going through all of these different things. And you were able to be part of the experience and see the editing happening live as it was around you. And you really felt like you were doing something cool. But at the end of the day, it wasn't an experience for experience sake. It was an experience that really talked about the features and benefits of what Nikon brought the audience, right? So To be a valid experience, it needs to invite that participation, have people become a part of it. It needs to be something that will resonate afterwards. So now people will have this little video clip they can put on social media, continue the conversation. It needs to be about your brand and your product in a meaningful way 
not just features and benefits. Here's bullet points on a slide. And it needs to really stand out from what other people are doing. And there's all kinds of things that you can do, all kinds of things that don't work, all kinds of things that do work. But the idea is to find that thing that triangulates, right? It understands what's happening again in the marketplace, it understands what your brand is all about, your products are all about, and really understands the audience and what makes them tick. You know what I'm hearing you say, it's, I mean, it's, it's all really good stuff. We could probably stop the call right now, but we, <laughs> what I'm hearing you say is essentially ideas are great and trying to build experiences, but you need a foundation to work from. You need yes. to draw ideas from a foundation. And, and, and I think this is the strategy part that people miss. They just start talking about, okay, well, let's get ideas out there to engage people. Like as an exhibit house company, we get people saying, oh, let's do a ski ball. And I'm like, why? You know what I mean? Like they just want to do stuff. So the foundation you're talking about is objectives. I love you said stakeholder alignment. I think that's a really big one. If you're an event marketer and you're running a trade show program or an event program, you need the alignment from your stakeholders. You need to understand what are these goals? What are we after? What are we truly trying to like cultivate? You know, mm -hmm. the idea about the audience, what kind of human beings are they? And then tying in what's happening in the marketplace, all that dumping out to what is the problem that you solve for yes. these people and how do you convey and connect the dots to them? But you got to work from a foundation. And that is like what I would urge is the strategy of what you're saying is you got to map that first. You have to have that brainstorm. Exactly. And that foundation doesn't just help you figure out what to do when you're at the show. That should be done way in advance. So you figure out which events to go to in the first place, or if an event is even the right approach, right? You might do your audience research and realize, you know what? We're trying to talk to CXOs as, as our main target audience, mm -hmm. but we're going to these events where only 10% of them are CXOs. And by the way, they're already working with competitors and there's no really opportunity to tell our story. Why do we keep going to this yeah. event, right? Yep. And then you need to size your presence at the event. Well, CXOs aren't wandering the floor looking for a booth to walk in and engage somebody, they're going to these private sessions and having networking opportunities and conversations at a much different level than the average event attendee. So it's really understanding who are you trying to target? What is What events are they going to? And, and be very careful of, of how show producers, and with full due respect to all of them, but how they represent their data, right? Ask the questions to understand about that audience makeup, really get in down to brass tacks because they all say, oh, 50% or 80% of our audience are decision makers. What is a decision maker? I'm a decision maker. You're a decision maker, right? Um, Sometimes. <laughs> right? Ask my wife. She's always the decision maker. Yeah. So it, it depends on who are the people you're really trying to reach and make sure you're looking at that prospectus and you're questioning the prospectus and then doing the hard math to recognize that, well, wait a minute. Yeah, the event has 10,000 people. But there's only 12 people that are actually my target audience. Why am I there? There's a cheaper way to approach that 12 people, right? So it's, yeah. it's important to do that. But you're right. The foundation is critical to choosing the right event, choosing what your size is at the event, choosing your experience, understanding your surround activities. How does the event fit in context with all of your other marketing and sales activities? And then really, how are you going to follow up and, and build the relationship with that audience over time? Because unless you are a, a transactional product where, you know, something you buy off the shelf, it's a bottle of water, it's a purse, it's a, I don't know, it's a, it's a container of uh, chips, right? Mm -hmm. Unless you're that kind of company, most of the time, your audiences need several touches to build relationships in order to buy your products or your solutions. So think about your events in that context. I like what you said about kind of how to look at the data of attendees to break down what kind of experience you should be driving and really what the outlook is, right? So, I mean, you're saying, let's just say round number, it's it's 10,000 attendees, right? That's mm -hmm. that's attendees. That, that's that's everybody there. You, you could probably safely pull 30% out of that. I mean, just yeah. instantly on people that are there to exhibit in different things, then you start narrowing down. Do you really know your target audience? Boiling it, boiling it. And you're like, there's maybe 500 people here that we can have a decent conversation with. And then mm -hmm. everything should really run in that space. How many opportunities can you pull from that? That helps you justify what? Like your spend that helps you justify the experience that you create. Is that kind of how you'd go about it? Yeah, it helps justify your spend. It uh, justifies your experience. It understands how you architect that experience, right? How am I going to get those 500 people to actually come to my booth or go to my session or engage with my team in some way? 
So then the hard work begins of, okay, how can I promote to those specific people before the event? Because if you build it, they're not going to come, right? You need to make sure that you have some sort of a strategy to promote yourself within the context of what the show producer is doing, but outside of that as well, whether it's through your own customer and email list, through recommendations and referrals, through folks you're already targeting in your marketing. So it's it's really, really important that you don't rely on just a show producer to make your events successful. You're responsible. No one is coming to help you. They're just trying to make you give them money so that they can host the event, right? You want to yeah. make sure that you are successful. So it's up to you to build that audience. So Ian, say, say I'm a, you know, I'm a global event marketer for a brand, right? Mm-hmm. And I have gone through and I've, I, I have my objectives. I have three or four very clear objectives for a large event. I understand my audience there. Maybe it's segmented into two different people, right? Which is yep. common. I have stakeholder alignment, considering what's happening in the market and the trend and my brand and all, all of those cool things. And I'm thinking about the problem that we solve for these people and the value that we drive to them. How do I start thinking and creating an experience from that? Is it just starting to throw ideas out there of how to be outside the box, right? Is it, are you thinking visually and creatively first in terms of design? Are you thinking more about the engagement, like the physical interaction? Is there a place that you start or you just begin ideating? Um, you can begin ideating, certainly. Sometimes that's a good place to start because it opens up the universe to give you all kinds of different information to draw from. But I like to start with, what does our brand stand for? What do our products do? What are the features and benefits of our solutions, right? So start there and think about it in the context of how people will use them, where they're being used, what is the benefit for people, and then be able to find interesting ways to do it. And for example, what I saw you know, my client Eaton do at CES was they wanted to showcase how their work powered electric cars, right? So they do a lot of components inside electric cars. And instead of having this shelf filled with all these components with descriptors on that, they built a shell of an electric car and they put all the little components within this shell and they were able to demonstrate what each one of those components do in the context of the electric car, right? And so it's really thinking about that. I've seen other companies when I was working with IBM in the smart city space, right? And what they did was instead of talking about smart cities in this very esoteric way, they created an augmented reality wall, which allowed you to sort of see what a smart city looked like. And they were able to show in context. And it was a very interesting approach where people could participate and they could touch on things almost like one of those big museum dioramas, but it was interactive and it was engaging and it was digital, they could see what the impact of the smarter cities technology would do for them, what artificial intelligence did with with traffic lights, with everything from energy usage, and, and you, you can imagine it. So it's taking what you do on a micro level and then blowing it up to a macro level and finding out what's the problem it solves and what's the context I can tell the story in. And then how can I then make the audience a part of this story, right? Everybody wants to be a hero in their own story. And those things that really engage people are those that are going to get the most attraction, the most folks to be interested. I mean, stay away from things like prize wheels and magicians and jugglers and all of that, unless you're selling juggling balls or, you know, trick cards or what have you. So think about your, your products or solutions in context and then how people use them and then how can I really have people experience this in a meaningful way that's not just going to activate their mind, but activate their heart as well. What's going to make them go, yeah. wow, that was cool, right? So we got a couple of questions here. Bernie wants to know, Bernie's basically asking about pre-show marketing, right? Like, you know the right show, you know you have the right target audience, but how do you peak and draw interest into your exhibit space ahead of time, right, is the question. I mean, I would say right away, Bernie, like I think good trade shows take effort is what I think. Honestly, there is like, people are always looking for like a magic pill, magic bullet, but I think they take effort and coordination between sales and marketing to set appointments, to market and get your message out there that you're going to be there, what you're offering, creating a draw. But I think it's a lot of hustle work and the companies that put the hustle in typically can draw traffic. But Ian, I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Matt. In fact, the most important person or or team in making your event successful is not your event team. It is not your marketing team. It is your sales team. 
yep. right? Your sales team knows which prospects and which companies they're going after. They know which customers they won't want to expand or grow, right? They need to be engaged from day one and have alignment in everything in the event that you're planning so that they can ensure they understand and they're able to take that and really make it shine through the content they're sharing. Um, and marketers and event marketers, we need to enable them with everything that they need in order to be successful in doing email outreach or telephone outreach or having conversations with their prospects and customers so that they can make sure the audience shows up, right? The other thing yeah. you need to make sure is sales is engaged during the event. You need to have actual salespeople at the event to engage your customers. I can't say this enough. Too often, event marketers rely on brand ambassadors that are hired outside to engage with folks with maybe a single salesperson on the floor to answer those really hard questions. But your sales team needs to be at the event and they need to be engaging and having meetings with your customers. They need to be out there to answer questions with your prospects. They need to be speaking alongside experts to make sure that they know that or their, your audiences know that, hey, this is a, a source of trust, a source of information. I can really understand from them what I need to do, and they can walk you through that process. One of my favorite tactics I used to engage years ago was have your salespeople walk your key customers around the entire show floor, not just your booth, but have them be the tour of the whole event so that they could understand what their customers were interested in by observing them. They could see what their competitors were doing. They could engage and answer questions and in introduce them to competitors in some case and say, hey, we wanna learn more about this thing because it helps you monopolize customer time in a meaningful and useful way to everybody and allows you to frame the conversation in a way you want it to be and you know make sure that your brand looks really good. So there's all kinds of little things you can do, but your sales team, is critical to your event success from the beginning, during, and even after the event, because the whole follow-up piece is critical again to your success. Yeah. You know, what's one thing I would add to that, Bernie, as well. I mean, I agree with everything Ian said. I think it does come from sales is essentially like, you know, data plays a part in that. And if you're going to trade shows over and over and over the same one, you need to be building your own data from those shows to then use years after, because having to buy data, having to scrape it from the associations and others is very difficult to use. Look, everybody's doing the same stuff. They're running ads, they're sending emails, they're using social, they're trying to create a buzz. But at the end of the day, how do you get the contacts of the people that are going to be there and then offer and entice entice them to come to your space. And a big piece, like Ian said, is having sales set meetings, make appointments. Hey, I've been prospecting you for six months. We will be at this show. Are you going to be there? I would love to have you over to our booth for X, right? But what is it that you're offering them? So you've got to have something to offer with an invite to get them over there. And I think having good data can drive people. That's, that's just me. It's critical. And, and data can not only drive people, can drive that relationship over time, but you can even get data from people who didn't attend. Ask them why they didn't attend. Yeah. And try to get that yep. information from them because every point of data is good data, even if it's data that goes contrary to what you think. Yeah. This is a good question here, Ian. It's from Maribel. And Maribel, thank you for the question. Bernie, also thank you for the question. How would you showcase for a fresh cut produce company? I ask, can you further define the fresh cut? right? Produce company. And Maribel saying a prepackaged salad company that also provides shredded lettuce, onions, tomatoes, right? So right off the top of my brain, Maribel, what I'm thinking is that that's convenience. I don't know what you're thinking in, but I'm thinking a fresh cut salad that's prepackaged that you can grab and run is like a convenience thing. So I don't know from a marketing standpoint, if that's a part of your pitch, or if it is that it's fresh cut plus convenient, but I would be thinking something along in those lines, but I'd love to hear what Ian thinks. Well, I think it depends on who you're targeting, right? Are you targeting retailers who are going to sell your product or you're, are you targeting end customers and that sort of thing, right? For you know, retailers, you need to obviously show how they're going to make money with this, right? At the end of the day, they're trying to figure out what is the best way for me to merchandise and, and bring your fresh cut salads to market in a meaningful way. And by the way, there's a thousand companies that do what you do. How do you stand out? Is your fresh cut produce fresher yep. than everybody else's? Is it organic? Is it tastiest? Are your mixes proprietary, right? Do, are you the only person who's using, I don't know, figs in your, in your salad, whatever it might be. So find that differentiator, which you should be doing with your, your product development anyway, and use that as an opportunity to make sure you're messaging those retailers. But at the end of the day, retailers are super concerned 
about their customer experience. So when I think about what you can do in event marketing to help them, obviously you want to let them sample the product, right? They need to see it. They need to see how it is display. So if you have some opportunities to do some unique merchandising in your in your event or trade show to show them what makes it stand out, maybe some complimentary things. I was lucky to work with Casey Masterpiece in Kingsford years ago. And one of the biggest barriers that they had was barbecue sauce and charcoal are sold on two opposite ends of the store. And by the way, those two opposite <laughs> ends of the store are nowhere near the meat. Right. So we were able to convince them through an experiential marketing campaign we did was to have POP right next to the meat case, which was amazing. Right. So we were able to have charcoal and barbecue sauce right next to the steaks and the chicken and all of that sort of stuff. So it was uh, it was super meaningful to them. So think about that. Think about what your retailers challenges are. If you're targeting the retailers, it's how do you help them with pricing? Of course, you need to be competitive with differentiation and then how they can merchandise it most effectively. And if your end audiences and consumers do samples, right? Let, let them get out there and, and see the difference and understand it. I mean, I'm sure you know this, but there is a huge trend in both flavor profiles and be able to mix and try different flavors as well as a trend in organic and healthy eating. So it's really good. I, I would say that for me as a consumer, if you have a, a fresh cut salad that doesn't taste like the weird chemical wash that most of them do, that would be something, right? So if you can find, yeah. you know, and no one talks about this, fresh cut salad that doesn't taste like like ammonia would be awesome, right? You have to disguise it with dressing. But if you're a guy who doesn't like dressing, then you're kind of in a mix, right? You're in a mess. You're going to figure that out. So there's some thoughts for you. I like that, Maribel. It's a good question too. And I think it goes further back to what we said earlier, which is typically a lot of the questions is somebody is asking, hey, how do I do this? How do I showcase this product? How do I do that? And I think Ian, with the answer saying, well, who's it for, right? You almost go backwards to go forwards. So you know, you're saying it's for retailers and for food service operators, right? For both. So then it goes back into some of the things Ian was saying. And I, I think what's really cool about that is that it is the devil's in the details. It is going in the details. Who's it for? What's the value proposition? Is that it tastes good? Is that it is convenient? Is it, you know, are you trying to get the retailers? Are you showcasing your salads in the salad dressing aisle maybe, right? You know, next to it, like you did with the meats and stuff like that. Is there different things? But I think kind of the devil's in the details. Ian, what you mentioned earlier, we talked about audience and who they are as human beings, right? Yes. I see a lot of really bad persona profiles, right? Me too. When, Yes. Okay. So when you're asking somebody, it's like, you know, Mary Beth in marketing or something, right? It's, it's always it, it's terrible. Talk to us a little bit about what it looks like to look at your audience and really understand who they are. There's several tools you can use, right? The first and easiest is a survey, right? So design a survey to get to know who people are, where, what, describe your work environment, describe what you do in a day? What sort of things are you into? Do you like motor sports? Do you like fishing? Do you like going to the theater? What do you drink? What do you eat? All of those different things that sort of define who we are as people or, or the, how we behave. So a survey is an easy place to start, but it only gives you part of the picture. It's sort of a baseline. Go, okay, well, 70% of people like NASCAR, this target audience. So maybe NASCAR is some sort of hook I need to fit in here. And how can I make that happen? Well, my brand is about performance. So, hey, there's certainly something that I can do there with NASCAR and we can build something together. But beyond the survey, you need to really understand who they are as people and it needs to go with interviews, right? So I like to try to do anywhere from a half a dozen to a dozen individual interviews of people who are the target audience, just to have a conversation with them, get to know what their pain points are, what bothers them, what do they wish that they had to make their life easier, what do they do during the day? All those certain things, all those things. What kind of media do you consume, right? We all say, oh, everybody's on social media. Not true. There's actually, when you get to some personas, they might use YouTube for education, but the rest of the time, they're not online at all, right? Or they only go on social media once every month to check in with their grandkids, right? So it's it's important to recognize that there are other channels we need to use to, to meet people. And understanding what those channels are is going to be critical, so beyond the interviews, I also like to observe people, right? So I try to get into the field and watch people in their day-to-day, -day, right? I'm told about this uh, electrician thing I've been working on, and I'm trying to get out to some commercial sites where they're installing electrical equipment just to watch how they're doing it, what they're doing, what sort of tools they're using, 
what time they get there, what do they do in their lunch break, what do they talk about, right? So observing them is the third way. So it's observation, it's focus groups or interviews, and it's surveys. By using those three things, um, you can get a really good understanding of your target audience because, huh, who is that? I mean, I used to, when my kids were younger, I used to play this game with them when we go out to like to the mall or shopping or something. And it would be, who are you and what do you do for a living? And describe your life. And we, instead of just people watching, we would make up stories about the people who are around us just based on their appearance. And it was a fun game. And it allowed you to sort of think outside the box of who people are. And we sometimes would come up with surprising stories, right? Um, and come up with something, well, oh, no, that person isn't that. It's this, right? And so it, it's a unique way to sort of start thinking about who are people? What is their life like? It's a, There was a word that was used over and over at the Experiential Marketing Summit a week or so ago. And the word was empathy. And so by observing people, talking to them, learning about them, you develop the sense of empathy and really feel for who they are as people and what they're going through. And once you have that empathy, you will be much better equipped to come up with a persona that's meaningful. I, I mean, I've done countless personas and I've done personas on everything from IT people to bakers to everything in between. <laughs> and you know what I find is often you get surprised by the personas you create. I did this persona on IT folks years ago. And what I learned about IT folks, which was sort of a surprise to me, is they index higher as married people than almost every other role. And when a lot of people think about those geeks and nerds back in the day, it was like, oh, they're all single loners who play video games in their basement. No, not the case at all. A lot of them had wonderful families and, and lots of kids and, and you know, very, very home-oriented people not out there just playing video games all day, right? You learn things like that. You learn that a lot of things they read have nothing to do with technology. You know, a lot of them read art magazines. <laughs> You're like, what? And so it, it was interesting yeah. to sort of these things that you find out about. And again, generalizations are dangerous. So you have to be careful of them anyway. But really digging in and understand as a generalization who people are, what makes them tick by observing them, be part of it is critical. Like, like uh, a good example is Dunkin' Donuts or Dunkin' Now. They have this campaign, America Runs on Dunkin'. And the way they came up with that insight was to actually work in Dunkin' Donuts stores. They sent the agency to work in the stores to observe what people were doing, how they're living their lives, yep. what really positioned them. And what they learned is in the parking lot, there were cars from all walks of life. And people got there early in the morning. They grabbed their coffee and their donut or their croissant. They went off to the day. And there were everybody from trade workers to executives to working moms, to you name it. And they came up with the idea that we're all together. We're all part of America. There's no left and right. There's no up and down. It's And what makes us run is Duncan. It's like getting your fuel in the morning. And that's where they came up with the idea by observing people. They never would have if they didn't go through that step. I like that. I think there is such a human side, especially B2B, it gets lost at times. So mm -hmm. really understanding who people are, I think it allows you to pull at threads as a company and mm -hmm. to touch them deeper than just what your value proposition is. It's making people feel heard and felt essentially, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. and you can connect with your customer better that way. I like that you said pull at threads because it allows you not just to pull on customer and audience threads. But with the yeah. information you learn, you can pull on company threads and unravel a lot of the truths and the assumptions you made when you developed your products and solutions, right? You might find that, you know what? No wonder we're not selling this. It's designed the entirely, entirely the wrong way. It's not really solving their real problem. Their real problem is X and we designed something for Y. And, and those are very uncomfortable conversations to have. But when you're armed with the information about your customer, it can change everything from your event approach to your marketing approach and sales approach to how your company products and solutions are out there to why your company was founded in the first place. So it's really, really critical to, to question and learn and observe and study because at the end of the day, we're all here to make a difference in people's lives. Ian, I have this bit of a thought that I'd love to test on you or at least discuss with you because I think we have a good conversation with it, which mm -hmm. is... I'm a firm believer that in a trade show setting, you have to fight to stand out and attract attention. You have to wow. You have to go do something. I'm not saying be the clown for the sake of being the clown, right? But I think you have to go into a convention center hall, activating in a space, and you got to fight to stand out. You got to fight to be different and unique and have people walk up and be like, wow, this is amazing, or wait, what's going on here? Or 
what are you doing? What, what are your thoughts on, on that? I think first and foremost, recognize that again, we'll go back to the, who is your target audience and your booth doesn't need to stand out to everybody. It just needs mm -hmm. to stand yeah. out to your target audience, right? So when you design your booth around that target audience, you'll be a lot more successful first and foremost. The other thing that you can do, and I, I do this myself for a lot of my clients, is do an audit of the event. And then year over year, you get a sense of what your competitors are doing and what's working and what's not working. And you can go in with an objective perspective and, and look at, okay, what's the messaging and the content? What's the experience look like? What's the size of the booth? What's the pre and post communications that this competitor is doing? How does it fit in the context of all the other stuff in the event? Because the last thing you want to do is stand out so badly that you don't fit in the context. Yep. But it really is understanding what your target audience is looking for. And then understanding, again, that, that marketplace, that context in a meaningful way. And that doesn't help you during the live event, but it will help you next year. Or the other thing I've done is I do landscape studies where I will look at what a competitor is doing over the course of several events. So it informs all of your future events. So you may or may not be at those shows. It gives you a chance to see what's happening. So again, understanding that context, being able to target your specific audience is super important. Now, then how do you wow people? You need to be able to think that sometimes a whisper is the loudest thing that you can do. With everybody trying to you know, beat their chest and scream louder than each other, it only creates an environment that's uncomfortable for folks. So one thing I, I noted as a trend, I did some work for IAEE a couple of years ago on trends in, in experiential and event marketing. But one of the trends out there I really, I discovered and I really liked was intimate environments, right? So creating an environment of intimacy where people can have quiet, comfortable conversations. I mean, that's just one trend to look at, but depending on your objectives, you need to build that in. So how do you wow people? Well, it depends. It depends on Again, what your objectives are, if you want your booth to really stand out, the first thing I would say is make sure your design is meaningful and intentional. Don't necessarily just have another rental property that everybody else has and had a reskinned. Think about the layout of the booth. Think about the graphics. Think about how many products you're bringing in. And do you even need to bring any products or is your whole story about some experience in a conversation and you can work with the product stuff later or in a different context, like a, a virtual display of some sort? Think about the booth design itself. That's got to be critical. Look at ways where you can, again, engage that audience. And here's where humans really matter. Make sure you're staffing your booth with people who are good at talking to other people. Or if you're having something like a business theater, make sure it's engaging that you have a speaker who is trained. And even though that person might be an executive of your company, if they don't know how to present and people fall asleep, it doesn't do you any good. It's important to make sure your speakers are are really articulate and they attract an audience and that they're fun and they're comedic and all of those things that you look for when you're enjoying a speaker. And by the way, if you do build business theater in your booth, make it more about customers than about you or about the people at the show. Again, people have a lot of self-esteem and they want to be part of the experience. So design your event and, and your booth in a way that allows people to become a part of the story because if people see other people having fun and engaging with your brand in a meaningful way, they'll want to be a part of it, right? There was a booth a couple of years ago I went to, I can't remember the brand off the top of my head, but they had this whole theater set up that was behind, the whole booth wasn't closed and you had to get a ticket to go into the booth and see this amazing, you know, three-dimensional experience that this company was doing with all these different industries represented. And it had a huge line. Everybody wanted to go in to see what was behind these four white walls. Um, and they were all trying to get an invitation to go in. So they had this <laughs> uh, they had this sort of thing where you had to, number one, prove who you are. You needed to talk about, answer these fun questions. And once you went through this entire profile, then you were allowed to go in. And by the way, it was a big data collection exercise. So they're able to understand everybody who went in. And it's not that they refused entrance to anybody, but they made sure they knew who it was who were going in and they saw what people observed and they were able to, you know, track what they did afterwards. So, you know, if, again, it's got to be the experience. It, it can't just be the biggest, loudest thing for no reason. It has to be based on your brand, based on your target audience and be meaningful in a way that your target audience will appreciate. I like that a lot. Talk to me about campaigns, right? I push yeah. this pretty heavily with our clients is trying to get them to think in the sense of a campaign for their, if it's a single trade show booth or mm -hmm. if it's multiple trade show booths, we want them thinking in a campaign mentality rather than just an execution of a trade show. 
Tell me some of your thoughts on that and sort of how treating your trade shows like a campaign is beneficial. That is critical, right? So when the best advice I could say is think like the CMO, right? Think like a marketer. And they see an event or a trade show as a single tactic in a full mix of different touches they have to reach and engage with that audience. And while events and trade shows tend to be the largest line item of a budget just because that's what it costs to execute them, they are also not necessarily as important as all the other things in their campaign, right? So when you think about trade shows, think about it as a point in time, at least that's how most people think about it. Think of it from there to points over time, right? So there are different events that have different purposes in your event portfolio. There are some events that are designed to as top of funnel events, a trade show to collect leads or a speaking opportunity to drive awareness of your brand or your products or solutions would be top of funnel activities. Events can also be mid funnel activities where you're trying to drive conversion or drive more consideration. And that can happen at the same event, but it would be in customer conversations that are happening in a meeting room at the same event, right? You're trying to move somebody who already was aware and already in your pipeline a little bit further down the pipeline by having a deeper conversation about what their specific needs were, how your company can come to the table with the right solutions for them and that sort of thing. So when you think about an event, recognize that the CMO and executives in your company really are seeing it as part of a bigger mix of omni-channel activities or integrated marketing activities. And you need to think about events the same way. Not that every event's not critical, but you need to then think about your event as a mini campaign. What are you doing before the event to attract the audience and make sure that they're going, they're going to your booth? What are you doing to make sure you're capturing their data in a meaningful way at the event and giving them an engagement that's going to move them from awareness to consideration at the same event? Maybe even get them to conversion again, depending on your product or your solution. Um, and then what are you doing after the event, right? What are the touches that you're going to have afterwards? An event is a great place um, to capture a ton of content and then syndicate that content over time. So you can have an event. We just did it. Stuff. Yeah, for exactly. Right. So we just now did you've got it. all yep. these little sound bites you can use. You've got video you can use. You've got graphics. You've got photo photos. You've got customer stories you captured. All of that sort of stuff you can then use for other marketing touches over time. And by the way, if those marketing touches are successful, they can create micro events, right? Maybe there's a series of webcasts you do after the event because people seem to be interested in these four points that you had at the event. And there was a lot of stuff. So you need to go deeper, which brings me to when you're doing campaign thinking, you also need to understand what is the right information to share with your customer or prospect at the right time in the relationship. And by that, I mean, I like to use a dating analogy. If you're on a first date, the first question out of your mind, out of your mouth should not be, how many kids do you want to have? right? It needs to be, you know, tell me about yourself. Let's learn a little bit about each other. What kinds of music do you like? What do you like to eat? That sort of thing. So when you think about the, the event in that context, the first touch of an event, you want to learn more about them. You want to ask questions. If you go on a date and you're the one doing all the talking, you're not going to get a second date, right? If you're the person that asks questions and shows a genuine, authentic interest in those prospects and customers, they're going to remember that. They're going to feel seen. They're going to feel appreciated. And they'll then you'll get permission to have that next conversation about what your interests are. Who are you in? What are you into? What kinds of things do you like to do? And then you can you know, start sharing a little bit of information about your solution and the benefits of it at a second event. Maybe the third event, you start talking about, all right, here are some specific things that we can do for you based on what we know about what your problems and solutions are and, and so on and so on. So think about events going from top of funnel to mid funnel to end of funnel to even on the back end loyalty and advocacy because you'll have some customer only events that are their user groups and that sort of thing where you're trying to teach them how to use a product teach them how to get more out of their relationship with you have them become raving fans of your brand and your products and solutions so it makes the front end of marketing easier for the other folks so really it's important to think about events as a touchstone and a total relationship and then what's the kind of content and conversation you're going to have at each one of those touches. If you were talking, you know, maybe say it's your niece and she's a young event marketer and she's guess, just getting into the role and you guys are sitting at a family party or something and she's telling you like, hey, look, I hear this word experiential being thrown around. And she said like, what, is it, what does it really mean to be experiential at an event or at a trade show? Hmm. How would you kind of break that down for her? I would basically say, you know, it's a, 
it's a way to do something fun with somebody that you like, right? It's not just going to see a show or going to see a movie. It's something you can become a part of. It's more like an amusement park, right? You get to go, you get to do these really cool and fun things, and you get to learn something along the way. So maybe it's an educational amusement park, which if it was a niece, you'd be like, oh, gross that, but, or uncle. But it, it's that, really. It's It's a way to... Give people something cool to do that allows you to get to know a little bit about the person that you're with. Gives them something cool to do to allow them to learn about you. Or that should be kind of the aim of what brands are trying to do, right? And I mean, at, at a very simplistic form, you know, mm-hmm. you should be asking yourself, like, are we doing this? Are we giving our customers a cool avenue experience interaction that allows them to learn about us and how we can help them? Exactly. It's a good run there. Tell me a little bit about the follow-up, the back end of all this, right? You go through, you know, you set objectives, you get your audience, you're going to a show, you come up with an experiential idea, you run it like a campaign, you get through the pre-show, you get to the show, you execute well, you engage, you have meaningful discussion, conversation, engagement, and then you get now to the backside of an event yep. and you're following up. Mm-hmm. There's two things I think about when it comes to follow-up. Mm-hmm. A, is that people don't do it well. Mm -hmm. And B, I think about measurement and ROI and how that is really bringing everything together at the end of an event. What are your thoughts on the post-show, the follow-up, the measurement, that piece? Two things. I think you're right. People don't follow up very well overall, right? I I think that follow-up needs to be personalized, Right. And by personalized, I don't mean hello, first name. Thank you coming. <laughs> Thank you for coming to our show. Uh, it needs to be about, all right, hey, this is Tony who met with you at the event. Thank you so much for coming. I noted that you were super interested in this stuff and I wanted to have a conversation with you about, you know, going deeper into what you've got going on. Right. So it's, it really has to be about the person, what their interests were, and it needs to be consistent. Right. It can't be going back and pulling them in another marketing channel that, all of a sudden they're a, a qualified lead and maybe they've never had a conversation with you, right? It's like you go on that first or that second date, you really get to know somebody. And then all of a sudden they send you a newsletter <laughs> that says, well, thank you for coming to it. It needs to be personal again. Yeah. And again, consistent. As far as measurement is concerned, measurement is so critical and you need to understand your objectives. Like we talked about at the top of the show here, first and foremost, what are you trying to accomplish And then your measurement needs to be based on those accomplishments first and foremost, right? So there's all kinds of ways to measure an event. And people will talk to you about return on experience or return on objective or return on event. And, you know, the the one thing that matters is return on investment. So take all those other metrics and sort of put them all to the side. And what you need to do is think like a CFO or a CEO and say, all right, we had this event. We spent a million dollars at this event. What did we get out of it, Right. And telling them that this many people attended doesn't help your CFO. Well, that's nice. So how many people attended Disney World doesn't help me at all. You need to really get to the point where you're measuring things that matter. So it might be if your goal was brand awareness, are you serving people and were they becoming more or less aware of your brand in a meaningful way, right? Or you want to understand what was the impact to your pipeline. So you're going to take a look at, again, integrating sales and taking those leads and taking that information with the companies that you know or don't know and being able to qualify those opportunities and say, hey, these opportunities are all worth X. So the event touched this amount of pipeline. So for that million dollars, we have $12 million of pipeline that was influenced. So people move further into that pipeline or along that pipeline to close the deal. That's the one metric that's really going to matter for events, right? Like I said, there's a thousand ways to measure events. I usually do a series of surveys, depending on what people, I mean, you want to look at success metrics, right? Which is what we're just talking about. Did you influence pipeline? We were able to drive brand awareness. Did you increase consideration? Whatever your objectives were first and foremost. And then you want to get into diagnostic metrics as well. What you Were you successful? Were you not successful? And then why were you not successful or why were you successful? So if you learn why you were successful, do more of that thing. If you learn why you weren't successful, you need to find out how to correct and change that sort of thing, right? So there's all kinds of survey questions like a net promoter score. A lot of people use a little bit out of context. It's not really designed for events, but people use it all the time. You know, it's supposed to be about a brand after experience with a brand. But you can look at things, was, was my content relevant or value to you? That's an important one because it will help you change what your content was, right? 
um, were my, did we talk about things that were uh, meaning, what was the speaker well-educated? Do they really know the, the topic, right? There's all kinds of things to ask, but really own it down, right? What is the main thing you want to know about from a, a objective or a success metric? And then what are the, the three or four things that will help you improve the event? And like I said, you can use surveys, you can look at sales as a proxy for pipeline, or you can look at actual pipeline data based on who the people are. You can look at who has opted in, you know, how many hand raises, yeah, I wanted to use more. So we've got that sort of thing. So look at each one of those stages of what you're trying to accomplish and then try to understand success and then diagnose it. And I mean, there's a ton of things, again, you can ask. Actually, if you go to my my website, I'm in the process of doing a series of the most important survey questions to ask as a starting point. So you can take yeah. a look at that and we'll, we'll send you guys all the the information on that after the show. But yeah, the, there's so many things like measurement. I do it every day. I do thousands of, of measurements for clients all the time. And it just boils down to keep it simple. Don't measure things you're not going to act on. Make sure that you're doing things that are going to be meaningful to the enterprise, not just meaningful as, as sort of a vanity metric. So, you know, I had this conversation a ton at Exhibitor Live with a lot of event marketers asking, how do they do it? Right. Like we were discussing a lot of us say, hey, what's kind of burning on you right now? What's What's the topic you're interested in? And one of the things I thought was interested is a, a lot of companies and event marketers being asked to be able to measure brand awareness. And back to what you said is not exactly an ROI thing, but they're wanting to measure it. And I thought, interestingly enough, what you're saying about the surveys and spe- and like the specific questions is something that I was sort of leaning into with talking to people was, hey, if you're going to do an exit survey from somebody, don't waste the question. The question, don't ask too many, but don't waste them. Ask something very specific. It could yes. be like, after leaving this experience, do you feel more inclined or less inclined that our product would be a good solution for you? Like be, be specific with the question to draw better answers and get more of a feel of, are we having an impact here? That's super important. And I'll, I'll point to the idea of having a pre-event survey as well, because at least then you have a, a baseline and you can then go back and compare what your average score was before the event to your average score after the event to see if it really did have a meaningful difference. Yeah. Nice. We're getting right on the hour here. I like to be mindful of people's time so that we get the most action-packed hour in that we can. And hopefully people will keep coming back like they have been. How can people find you? Where can they find your content? Where can they find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they contact you? Make it easy. I've got a a website, experientialexecutive.com, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Those are probably the best two channels for me from an overall professional perspective. I'm on Twitter as well, but a lot of people have mixed feelings about Twitter these days. So I try to keep a lot of my content to LinkedIn yeah. or my or my blog. And if you follow those things every day, I'm posting all kinds of stuff about event and experiential marketing. So check it out and I'd be happy to share that with you. And if you have questions or you want to have a chat, there's a link right at the top of my website where you can schedule time with me instantaneously. So happy to have a conversation with anybody. We just got a quick question from Kaylee. Thanks for the question, Kaylee. She said, do you think a pre and post show survey is too much to ask attendees to do? I absolutely do not. I think you have to be trying to survey, you know, your customers and prospects. I would just keep it short. And like I said, keep them short and make them convenient and ask very specific questions. You know, I don't know. I don't know your thoughts on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right, man. In fact, you have maybe eight to 10 questions before you lose people total, yeah. right? So a pre-event is fine. Just don't overtax them. Figure out what are the specific things you want to measure over the course of the event and only ask about those things. You don't need to have a 30-question pre-event survey and a 30-question post-event survey. Keep it short, keep it simple, get to the point, and you'll be able to use it. People are not averse to taking surveys. They're averse to taking too long surveys and way too many surveys. I mean, some of these events you go to and there's a survey after every single session. And while session surveys are valuable, some of them are 12 questions long. It's like, I am over surveyed. There's no way. But you ask a half a dozen questions before and after the event, you'll be fine. Ian, I've known you for a few years now, and it's nice to have you on the show. I truly appreciate you coming on here. I think you you really know your stuff. And, you know, when you talk about it, you, you can hear the fact that you're passionate about it and you can hear the fact that, uh, you know, you know how to execute, you know how to ideate. And again, I appreciate you spending time with us. Matt, thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. And thanks to all of you who joined us today. Really uh, great to at least get to know you through your questions and, and see your names out there. And again, if you... Uh, 
want to talk or have any questions, you don't hesitate to reach out. Always happy to have a conversation. Awesome. Ian, thanks for being here, everybody. As always, thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. That's a wrap. It's Event Marketing Redefined. I'm your host, Matt Kleinrock, and uh, can't wait to see you soon. Thank you so much, everybody. Ian, thank you again. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everybody. Mm-hmm.